I uh, hope you will all excuse me for the status of my voice uh, and for thus keeping my uh, opening remarks uh, rather brief. Uh, good morning. So on behalf of us all here at the Hong Center for International Dialogue and the Prince Mohammed bin Foud Program for Strategic Research and Studies at the University of Central Florida, I would like to welcome you to this morning's event, Breaking the Cycle, Creating Solutions for Water Security in the Middle East. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the Holling Center, we are a non-governmental organization charged with the mission of improving relationships between Muslim-majority nations and the West. In service of that mission, the Center hosts dialogue programs on a wide range of themes and topics, many of those topics that are traditionally underserved. In May of 2014, together with our partners at UCF, the Center hosted a dialogue titled High and Dry, Addressing the Middle East Water Challenge. The challenges created by the presence and lack of fresh water and resources are obvious. And yet, we often find that these challenges have been relegated behind more immediate pressing security issues or even overshadowed by other resources like oil. The dialogue we assembled with our partners began to address these water challenges and pose some initial thoughts on solutions that could be tackled on country by country or even basin wide bases. For those of you who are interested in a summary of how that dialogue transpired, you can find it on our website, hollingcenter.org, in a water snapshot report. But the purpose of today's event is to advance the discussion on solutions further, not just amongst our speakers here, but also with you here in the audience. To do that, we have invited uh, three experts. First to my left is David Dunkey. He was our partner on this initiative and director of the Prince Mohammed bin Foud Program for Strategic Studies at the University of Central Florida. He is an experienced Middle East expert, and David will serve as both today's moderator, and he will also be filling in for the role of Dr. Paul Sullivan, uh, who sends his regrets he had a family emergency last night and cannot attend. I'd also like to introduce Scott Moore to his left. He is a member of the Council on Foreign, Re Council on Foreign Relations International Affairs Fellow and Research Associate at the Belfer Institute for Science and International Affairs at Harvard. Scott's research has focused on policy work related to environmental issues, energy, and climate. And lastly, to his left, I introduced Raymond Karam. He is the associate and the Washington, D.C. representative of the East-West Institute, who focuses on emerging threats to regional security in the MENA region, as well as an expert in many Track 2 initiatives. So to save what's left of my voice, I will say I'll conclude that I'm very interested in hearing what our guests here have to say today as well as I look forward to the dialogue with them and the audience at the end of today's presentations. So I thank you, and I pass it to Dave. Thanks, Mike, and uh, let's hope your voice gets better. Um, I am a child of the 80s, so the uh, High and Dry Conference is, is also the title of a Def Leppard album, for those of you who missed it, um, and I couldn't resist. Uh, <clears throat> It's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you for, for organizing this, Mike. I am a very poor substitute for Paul Sullivan. Uh, he, is, he sent me what he would have said, which includes 50 recommendations, which I will not read uh, today, but we it will be in a polished form we'll post on our website as well as Howling Center website. Uh, with that, I'll just, I have a little extra time, so I'll filibuster a little, but uh, our, our program at UCF started two years ago. Uh, we have a number of partners. The Howling Center has been one. Uh, this is an ongoing water initiative that we hope to be uh, doing further programs in the region. We're looking at doing two in Saudi Arabia this year as well as one in Cairo. And we'll uh, keep information posted on, on the websites. Just as an introduction, I'll say, I believe it is an American idea, at least best that I know that a country that can feed itself is truly self-sufficient and strong. And looking at the modern history of Saudi Arabia, this is one of the lessons that did help influence a generation of Saudi leaders who are well aware, and this is still the case, of their economy's lack of diversity, invested heavily in non-energy related sectors of the economy over, over decades. And one of those areas is, was agriculture, this despite the fact that the kingdom only has 2% of its land that is ar arable, and the very obvious fact that it is, a, it is located in a dry desert climate, including such places as the empty quarter, which empty for a reason, and that's empty of water and everything else, has no rivers and suffers from a lack of rain. 
And I needn't note that water scarcity is, is kind of an important ingredient in production of agriculture, but perhaps it's something that should have been noted a little more at the time. But Saudi Arabia opted to invest in agriculture for decades, and the U.S. Department of Agriculture sent, sent expert after expert out over a number of years. Uh, one of the, the latest actually was the governor of Montana a few years ago, Brian Schweitzer, who actually served for over a decade in the kingdom, um, which is a little interesting footnote. But, you know, the kingdom uh, also provided, to help get agriculture going, uh, provided heavy subsidies for land, equipment, water, just about everything needed uh, to produce agriculture. This is also a jobs program as well as a developmental issue. And by many measures, the uh, Saudi model worked. Uh, even today, you look at, at the kingdom and you're talking about a workforce of about 9% about of the workforce is engaged in agriculture and agriculture-related uh, activities, which is over 600,000 people, not a, not a small number, particularly in a place that you're trying to diversify the economy and have jobs that are not related to the energy sector. Saudi Arabia does export foodstuffs uh, very robustly in the region, and it is home to the largest dairy farm in the Middle East, of course, benefited by subsidies provided by the state. You know, one particularly robust period of growth in the mid-80s to mid-90s, the agriculture sector grew by 70 percent alone. And by 1992, for example, Saudi Arabia was the world's fourth largest wheat exporter, this in a desert kingdom with 2 percent arable land. Pretty staggering fact. Although it, became, you know, it, it grew to that level, the cost of production was extremely high, and 66 percent of this cost was directly tied to agriculture. And when I say high, I mean it. And the statistics I had was the government was spending five times the market price of wheat uh, than uh, for a ton. Now, the kingdom has since stopped growing wheat altogether. And, you know, though misuse of fossil water for decades has seriously depleted natural aquifers, Saudi changes in practice, use, and heavy investment in technology has made a real difference. And today, the kingdom is actually a regional leader, not only in understanding the nature of the water challenge, but how to address it. Of course, having the resources to commit to this is, is critical. This is just one of many stories we learned at our conference that we held last May in, uh, off in Haibaleta Island off of Istanbul uh, at this conference. On a minor footnote, I knocked myself out and looked like I had been in a boxing match. But, Nonetheless, I still, I still learned this, and we had, we had people from about 12 countries uh, represented, all sharing very different stories. And, you know, this leads to how can we keep this, this movement going? Because we see um, resource issues are largely trumped by, in the media by political issues and the political turmoil, particularly in the Middle East. But these resource issues, particularly water and the challenges posed by it, must be better understood by policymakers. Uh, just today, the front page of the Washington Post, other than coverage of the State of the Union, it featured a story about Yemen's ongoing battles between Shia, Sunni, and tribal groups for political control of a very impoverished, instable nation. Yet there's no mention made in the story of the roots of much of Yemen's instability, which is the depletion of water. Sana'a, Yemen's capital, is on course by 2017 to be the first capital on the globe to run out of water. Now that doesn't mean Sanaa is going to be emptied of population, although you may see some, some movement of people inside the country, but it's going to commit further resources as to how you provide resources for, for a large city. And this is two years away. This is not the distant future we're talking about. You know, other, other kinds of things we, we, we discussed this conference, you know, each nation, uh, the challenges vary, but there's a lot of similarities. You know, and in almost everywhere in the Middle East, you see rapidly growing population and rapidly depleting water resources, almost everywhere. Saudi Arabia, for example, in 1960, had something to the tune of 4 million people. Today, we're talking about 30 million people. And you've burned up a lot of water since that time. Yemen, once the breadbasket of the Roman Empire, 
today obviously is running out of water in its capital, and much of the blame can be tied directly to cot production. And 60 percent of Yemen's water has been devoted to cot over the last few decades. Now, today's discussion, we hope to explore the increasing environmental resource-based challenges in the region um, the, and look at some of the ways this has happened. You know, overuse enabled by government subsidies, growing dem demographic challenges, misuse of what scarce resources do exist, and how they can be addressed. Because despite the gravity of the issue, many innovative ideas for solutions do exist and technological improvements provide hope for addressing the challenges down the road. And with that, I'm going to uh, open it up. We'll start with Scott. Um, Scott, in addition to everything Mike said about him, has, has published extensively, worked with a range of government and academic institutions, Brookings, the U.S. Department of Energy, uh, German Foreign Office, U.S. National NOAA, uh, and NASA. He has a uh, master's and doctoral degree from Oxford and has an undergraduate degree from Princeton. Just, you know, a Truman Fulbright and Rhodes Scholar, so we know he's not the sharpest knife in the drawer, right? And, uh, and with that, I'll, I'll let Scott take over. Uh, thanks, David. It's a pleasure uh, to, to be here. Uh, and I want to thank the Holling Center uh, for bringing us together, not only uh, today, but also for um, the dialogue that kind of launched this uh, this panel, and it's worth um, <clears throat> just pointing out that the three, three of us up here uh, represent just a small kind of um, subset of the, uh, the the wisdom that was gathered as part of this um, this panel, uh, and uh, certainly uh, on a topic that I think is very important. And uh, since uh, you're all here this morning, I, I, I think you you'd agree. Um, so what I want to do uh, today is just uh, uh, something in three parts. Give a little um, little background in three parts. So first of all, to kind of set the stage for um, uh, for the water crisis in the Middle East, um, because uh, it is a kind of distinct regional part of, uh, of a broader uh, global set of challenges. Um, second, to talk about um, several different types of solutions um, to uh, this water crisis. Uh, and then finally, to talk about some of the challenges that have been, uh, uh, that these different approaches have faced uh, in the Middle East region um, particularly. Uh, and then finally, of course, I'll, I'll offer some, uh, some thoughts on, on what the best um, path is forward based on that. Um, so it's very common, uh, and I'm sure uh, most of you here this morning have heard the phrase or, or used it, um, the world's water crisis or, or global water crisis. Um, I think it's, it's more uh, uh, interesting and, and in some ways more helpful to kind of think of, um, of there uh, as being several uh, very closely interlinked uh, crises. Um, we have a, a, a crisis of water allocation, where by far the dominant water use in countries around the world, and it's true of almost every country, uh, is for agriculture, typically uh, between 60 and, uh, and 80, 85 percent of total water use in any given country um, is for agriculture. But at the same time, in, in many parts of the world, we're having uh, vastly uh, growing demand for water for uh, urban uses, drinking water, industry, uh, things like that. Um, and the problem is that there is, in many places, just not enough water um, to meet those new demands as well as uh, existing ones, which are primarily for agriculture. Um, secondly, there's a crisis of water availability and supply. Uh, simply put, there's uh, a lot of people live in places where they don't have enough access to enough uh, clean water, um, and that's true both in urban and rural areas. Um, and uh, there's a, a kind of closely linked uh, crisis of water quality uh, linked to uh, increasing urbanization uh, and industrialization around the world. We're, we're seeing a lot of contamination of uh, not only surface water, but groundwater as well, um, which in many parts of the world is the, the dominant way that people um, get uh, drinking water uh, or for kind of higher uh, value uses. And the fact that um, uh, that you're seeing increasing contamination of those supplies, um, occasionally with um, heavy metals, arsenic, things like that, that are extremely difficult, if not impossible, to get out um, of the water is, is a, real, uh, a real challenge. Um, again, closely linked to that, a lot of parts of the world are uh, 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 rapidly depleting these underground water sources that have built up over um, uh, tens of thousands, if not, in some cases, millions uh, of years. And uh, David used the phrase uh, fossil water. It's a very apt one because once that water is uh, gone, it's, it's gone for practical purposes. 
Uh, and then finally, and, and maybe most interestingly, uh, we have kind of a crisis of, uh, of uh, kind of consensus uh, or agreement or stability uh, around water. Uh, again, if you look kind of around the world, um, one of the biggest flashpoints, not just between countries, but often between groups within countries, is water. Um, David mentioned the case of Yemen, which is a great one. Uh, and it also uh, kind of leads into my point in, in laying out these different crises. The Middle East is, is a little bit um, uh, uh, special or distinctive uh, among the world's regions in that all of these crises are going on uh, at once in the Middle East. So uh, oftentimes uh, you'll have sort of one or maybe two uh, of these crises uh, unfolding at one time, but the Middle East really has all of them, and that, that makes, um, makes dealing with uh, water resource issues especially challenging in the Middle East. Um, so there are basically three ways that you can deal with these types of, of water crises, and especially um, those that involve um, water quantity, which is what I'll be sort of focusing on. So, uh, you know, availability, supply uh, of water. Um, the first of those is technical, um, and that's been by far the most popular solution around the world. Um, historically, the two main ways of doing that are either you uh, build long canals or aqueducts from places where there's uh, where there's plenty of water to places where uh, you need it. Um, we have uh, several examples of that here in the Western United States, but this is an idea that, that goes all the way um, uh, back to the Romans. Uh, more recently and more kind of, um, uh, rele of, of greater relevance to the Middle East uh, is desalination. Uh, and that is a, a technology that really kind of started coming to the, to the fore and, and being commercialized in the 70s. Um, but just in the last decade has really become truly uh, a viable way to get large quantities uh, of water. Um, at the moment, it's still confined mostly to um, urban drinking water um, uh, uses. It's conceivable that, um, that in the future uh, it, could be, uh, it could meet some other urban um, uses as well. But for the moment, uh, it's still a pretty high cost solution and you really need, um, really need to meet most water use from, from other sources. Um, the second kind of way that you can try to deal with uh, some of these issues is, is regulatory. So whether uh, you pass a law or a set of regulations, uh, lots of countries, including um, uh, many states here in the U.S., have, uh, have rules or regulations concerning, for example, uh, how much water uh, different appliances can use um, to try to encourage conservation. Um, uh, Oman has uh, or had for a very long time uh, an interesting regulation where uh, uh, in order to dig a well, you had to obtain the personal uh, approval of the uh, Sultan of Oman. Uh, tended to be a pretty effective way of, uh, of uh, limiting the number of wells that were dug uh, in comparison to surrounding countries. Um, but you can, you know, sort of imagine that, that once we're talking uh, about kind of a, a, a national economy, trying to limit water use and regulate it through these kinds of measures is, is tricky, it's difficult, it's costly, um, and it's just uh, beyond the, uh, the capacity of a, lot of a lot of governments to do. Uh, and that leads me finally to uh, the third kind of set of solutions and the one that uh, I'll focus on a little bit today, which is economic. Um, and again, uh, there are sort of several different ways that you can come about this. Um, I think in some ways a, a helpful way to think about it is kind of um, by relation to uh, the debate over uh, climate change and limiting carbon dioxide emissions. So the two ways that people often uh, talk about this is, well, either we can implement a carbon tax, so we just make it more expensive to uh, emit uh, a, a given quantity of, of greenhouse gases, uh, or we can do cap and trade. We can uh, have the government set a limit uh, on how much, uh, how many emissions can be sort of used, or if you want to think of it like that, or how much carbon can be, uh, can be emitted, and then below that cap, uh, you have some way of, of uh, designating rights to different organizations, businesses, et cetera, who can then buy, sell, and trade those rights among themselves uh, on the principle that some, some of these organizations are gonna be more efficient um, at reducing their emissions than others. Um, so the same concept uh, has been applied in the, uh, in the case of water. Um, there are a couple of places where this has been done, um, this system called water rights trading. Um, the Western US, uh, Chile, uh, Australia, and China. Uh, among those, Australia is the only one that's really sort of managed to get this um, right, uh, and they've done it over a very long period of time, about 40 years, uh, and I'll, I'll talk more about that um, later. 
So ac these kinds of economic solutions have been, um, uh, have been proven to be very effective at dealing with a lot of these kind of um, subwater crises that I talked about. And in particular, what they're very good for um, is addressing um, uh, issues where you have uh, a very limited quantity of water and you have a lot of new uses that you have to satisfy. That's the case uh, in most parts of the Middle East and is probably the dominant um, kind of water challenge in the Middle East. So it makes it, I think, particularly relevant. Um, however, there are a number of reasons why um, this kind of economic approach, and in particular this idea of trading water rights, is really difficult um, to implement in the Middle East. Uh, and I'll uh, talk a little bit about um, that. And I think in the process, um, hopefully highlight some of the other uh, issues surrounding water in the region. Uh, and the first of these has to do with uh, state capacity. Uh, it's even though a lot of the advantages of the market are the once you kind of set up this trading system, it sort of is on auto autopilot and it uh, effectively uh, operates without a whole lot of direct government intervention. Uh, but in order to kind of set up the system, you need a lot uh, of, uh, of work on the part of governments. Uh, you need to uh, establish uh, some way of, dis of designating uh, rights to either individual farmers or agricultural collectives or whatever. Um, you need some way of, of deciding um, uh, who should get those rights uh, and how, what the quantity should be that each right um, confers. You need to uh, have somebody saying, well, we think that uh, that the sustainable limit of water use is, is uh, you know, at, is X. Um, so you set, to set the cap, that requires a lot of, um, a lot of detailed technical knowledge uh, and evaluation. And then you have to be able to monitor um, uh, in some way uh, how much uh, water people are using, whether they're using their kind of allotted uh, quantity under the, uh, under the trading system uh, and enforcing uh, breaches of that, uh, of that system. So it's, uh, again, not a, a simple thing to do. Uh, and it, as we look across the, the Middle East region, um, uh, that kind of state capacity issue is a huge, a huge challenge. Uh, and I, I just want to sort of put in a special note, uh, David mentioned Yemen, and that's the country that um, in the Middle East region that I've, um, I'm most familiar with. Uh, and uh, in, in a case like that, um, the international community has um, spent the better part of the last 20 years um, uh, devoting uh, hundreds of millions of dollars in aid trying to um, uh, enhance Yemen's uh, capacity in this kind of water uh, resource management area. Um, and it just hasn't, uh, hasn't quite gotten there. Uh, and so I think, again, looking around the region, um, uh, that kind of investment in institution, uh, institution building is going to be a big job, uh, and it's going to be expensive. Um, so if we really want to, um, uh, want to solve the, the problem regionally, it's going to require uh, lots, of, lots of resources, um, especially, um, especially lots more money. Uh, the second challenge um, basically has to do with um, authoritarianism uh, in uh, many of the countries in the Middle East region. Uh, this kind of uh, system, this uh, economic uh, way of addressing water scarcity, it basically runs up against a lot of entrenched um, ways of, of, uh, of allocating a very scarce and very important uh, resource. So again, particularly in places like uh, the Arabian Peninsula, um, water has long been uh, a way for local uh, elites, uh, sheikhs or, or what have you, uh, to, um, to control uh, uh, the population and to um, distribute uh, water, um, which is uh, the foundation, of course, of, of all uh, economic activity to political allies. Uh, and so when you set up uh, a marketized system, you, you totally strip out um, the political value uh, of, um, of allocating water. Uh, and that, that uh, has encountered quite a bit of resistance um, in, in a number of countries. Um, the second dimension of that has to do with food security. Um, David mentioned this in the case of Saudi Arabia, um, but it's one that is uh, a pervasive kind of objective across the Middle East region is to ensure um, that there's sort of a baseline level of, uh, of food security. And for that, of course, uh, you, need, uh, you need to ensure sufficient uh, supply of, uh, of water um, for irrigated agriculture and uh, often for uh, very water intensive crops like wheat. Um, that's a concern that um, tends to be particularly in the minds of, uh, of authoritarian leaders who are very concerned about the price of, um, uh, of staple food crops uh, and very concerned about the possibility that uh, some kind of um, disruption on the, on the world stage would result in, um, 
uh, in, in some kind of food crisis. Uh, and finally, uh, and I'll just sort of touch on this because uh, I think it, it, um, it's been covered a, a little bit by David and I think Ray uh, will, will uh, talk a little bit about it as well, but is uh, conflict. Um, so again, particularly in uh, Yemen, a lot of the reason why Yemen has a water crisis is that it has a security crisis. Um, and you haven't been able to uh, maintain uh, water infrastructure. Um, the government is completely preoccupied with, um, uh, with the security situation. And that in turn has really undermined the legitimacy of the government. It's a self, or it's a, a vicious uh, cycle. We're also starting to see that um, occur in uh, parts of Iraq uh, and certainly in Syria. Um, so, you know, to say, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's fine to, uh, to think of these sort of ideal uh, solutions to, uh, to a water crisis, but if you don't have uh, a baseline level of, of stability and security, uh, it's obviously completely, uh, uh, completely secondary. Um, so in terms of where, um, uh, so basically I guess the message I want to bring here is that we have a great solution uh, to a lot of the problems that, um, uh, that are, uh, are brought along with uh, the sort of crisis of, of particularly water scarcity in the Middle East. Um, the problem is that there are a number of institutional uh, barriers as well as, uh, as security barriers to trying to implement uh, those solutions effectively. Uh, I think that um, going forward there are two uh, big areas where, uh, um, where we can make some, some progress. And the first and most important of those is regional cooperation uh, under kind of the water uh, umbrella. David uh, mentioned that Saudi Arabia has really made a lot of, a lot of strides. Uh, in the past two decades or so in, in becoming much more sustainable in its use of water. Uh, and I think trying to uh, sort of uh, build that capacity in neighboring uh, regions uh, uh, is, uh, is critical uh, to ensuring that countries that don't have lots of uh, cheap energy and don't have uh, uh, big, uh, big government budgets like Yemen uh, can uh, make some progress uh, on its, uh, its water resource uh, needs. And the second big thing is I think some targeted investment in key technologies uh, would do a lot to alleviate, um, take the edge off, off of some of these, these challenges. The biggest one of those is uh, solar powered desalination. Um, if, we can get, um, the, um, if we can get sort of the efficiency of desalination up to the point where uh, you can uh, use renewable uh, en uh, technologies to, uh, to provide the energy as opposed to, to fossil fuel, uh, that will really um, help to uh, uh, help to take the edge off uh, the the challenges of scarcity, um, particularly in places like uh, the the Arabian Peninsula, where population is very much concentrated um, on the coasts. Um, so I'm going to just leave it uh, there, and I'll look forward to some discussion later. Thanks. Thank you, Scott. Uh, now we'll turn to uh, Ray Karam. Uh, Ray, you, you've been introduced by Mike, but we'll just add to it a little. Uh, Ray has been in, in, Ray is at the East-West Institute. He has been involved in Track 2 diplomatic initiatives with partners in the Middle East on regional security, nonproliferation, economic development, and, and environmental governance. He has also been facilitating, uh, since 2010, U.S.-Iran policy dialogues, which has served as a bridge of the, which has served as one of the few bridges for sustained face-to-face -face discussions between Americans and, and Iranians. Ray holds a BS from, in uh, Political Science and International Affairs from Hofstra and an MS in International Relations and Transnational Security from NYU and a Certificate in International Law from the University of Amsterdam. And with that, Ray, we'll uh, turn it over to you. Thank you, David, and uh, thanks to the Howling Center for uh, inviting me again and uh, for um, keeping up this process that started in Istanbul. Um, you know, we go to a lot of these uh, initiatives and, and conferences and then it's a one-off thing and, and you know we forget about it but then it's good to keep the process going and keep uh, uh, pushing this further. Uh, a lot of what I want to say today has already been covered surprisingly by you know these experts that we have with us um, uh, but if I can just um, focus on a couple of things here. Um, so we, we covered a little bit uh, the issue of water and food security in the region, um, the relationship between these two the you know the region that that has water scarcity, uh, but at some point wanted to uh, uh, be um, um, uh, have some kind of food security, uh, so spent a lot of uh, its fossil resources to uh, to cultivate this. But then at this point, um, you know we have this issue where there's no more water. Um, 
This is a kind of, I, I want this map nicely illustrates the, the issue of water scarcity in the region, uh, especially looking forward uh, 10 years from now. Uh, so the red zone, if you see concentrated in the region with uh, just a little few areas uh, where um, uh, it's approaching physical water scarcity, but mostly has uh, um, uh, complete uh, physical water scarcity. Uh, this. Uh, this map really illustrates the groundwater recharge rate. Uh, so in a lot of, a lot of these regions, you can actually uh, tap in your, your fossil uh, sources, uh, but, but in the Middle East, because, um, because of the lack of um, uh, you know, rain mostly, um, there's, uh, the groundwater doesn't recharge. So once you tap into that, um, there's nowhere else to go. Uh, the lack of arable land also, we've seen it um, decreasing over the past uh, few years. Um, so e e either it's intentional, like uh, Saudi Arabia, for example, that chose to, uh, to proceed this way, uh, or uh, in other countries like, um, um, like Lebanon, for example, Iraq, um, uh, Jordan. Um, this is just because of a lack of water, physical water. The issue of Yemen was, was covered already, so I'll skip over it. Um, but here I want to get to the relationship between these two things. So we've seen that this uh, also happening in Iraq and Syria, um, especially before you know, the current conflict in Syria, uh, where um, uh, you know, a lack of water, especially um, a drought that lasted a few years, uh, really affected uh, arable land and, and uh, wheat cultivation in Syria. Um, you know, as, as students of, of, what, of the Middle East and what's happening uh, in the region today, uh, be it called the Arab Spring, Arab Spring or, or, or the current situations, um, there's definitely a connection there. Well, we don't want to say that um, that there's a direct connection and there's conflict. Of course, all the theories about a conflict around water, um, you know, has has is a little bit exaggerated, uh, and and the risk. Um, a single catalyst of conflict um, is, is not really manifesting itself uh, now, but there are underlying drivers, uh, risk multipliers, and even instruments of violence uh, generated from this. Um, the extended drought, of course, the resulting food insecurity were major drivers of, of the upheavals. Um, uh, most recently, when ISIS took over the, the Mosul Dam in Iraq, um, you know, the region was very close to, uh, to grave military and humanitarian crisis, um, be it accidental because, you know, these people did not know how to maintain the dam, uh, or intentional because they wanted to, um, you know, flood um, uh, arable land that was behind the dam, or cause some kind of humanitarian crisis, uh, you know, uh, uh, beyond the dam. Uh, the major issue here, and this is what I really want to focus on, to keep track of these two is is our approach to this um, so we have this food that is really important the water that you know allows us to grow the food uh, and the energy that allows us to you know pump the water or, or um, you know bring the water to to to, our, to the fields um, over the past years this this approach has been extremely siloed uh, so the governance of food water and energy resources is very fragmented at both the national and transboundary levels um, yeah, these sectors are, looking at them, they're so interconnected to the point where a solution in one sector can mitigate or, or exacerbate the crisis in another. Uh, for example, globally, 70% of the world's freshwater resources are consumed in agriculture. Yet, our conversations, our research shows that agriculture producers rarely engage in coordination, planning, or project development um, uh, with each other to create synergies or to see how they can, you know, save water resources uh, and advance their plans. So they look at it, especially when it comes to water, every person or every company going in and every, uh, every farmer looks at water as an infinite source uh, or something that is supposed to be there. Um, but, you know, there's, there's no future planning, for example, what will happen in 10 years or, or so. Um, the food, you know, they look at it as, as, uh, as just an input, the water and energy is just an input. The energy, uh, water is an input, food is an output, and in water, the food and energy systems um, are just users of the source. So what we try to do in our approach is to, uh, is to bring in more of this nexus. Um, uh, this nexus is not 
um, it's not being done uh, involuntarily, so it needs to be facilitated by somebody. Governments are not planning this, um, so we're looking at outside sources like organizations, NGOs, um, you know, facilitate track two uh, to bring in all these various sectors together. Uh, something that is an ad adaptive process for this complicated world that, that, we're, that we're living in. Um, and mostly a cross-sector, um, public and private approach um, that transcends the sectors and the national boundaries. So there's this really nice illustration here. Uh, sorry for the bad graphic. Um, it was done by um, a, an academic, so it's not very good. <laughs> but, uh, but it's done by a really brilliant person, our partner at Texas A&M, uh, Rabia Mukhtar, who, who's one of, one of the really uh, uh, forward thinkers on, on this issue. Um, and basically what this, what this brings together is um, um, with this global government, uh, government structure that we have that it's, that it's really um, struggling to deal with these complex 21st century problem, um, we're looking to be a convener uh, um, of these issues with expertise and an agility to provide a platform for stakeholders with contrasting priorities um, competing agendas uh, that don't have trust uh, or even speak the same language uh, to engage in evidence-based results-oriented problem solving. Um, so as you see, what this really does um, is, um, is illustrating how this process will cut across scales, sectors, geographical boundaries, and the public-private divides. Uh, it builds bridges along what's really important is the, the continuum of science, policy, and politics. Uh, and, and it strives to get some sort of policy coherence among the various uh, domains and institutional fora, such as, um, you know, we mentioned the silos, the sec sector-specific development strategies, uh, the investment and, and, uh, and, uh, and the trade uh, regimes that we have. So looking at this, you, it's very complicated, just as the picture illustrates, but also in a region like the Middle East, you would think that it's even more complicated. Uh, not because, you know, there's lack of coordination within each country, uh, there's lack of coordination between, you know, between neighbors. Uh, most neighbors are, um, uh, are not talking to each other, they're not on, fl on friendly terms. Uh, uh, so, um, but there's good news there. And the good news is that we actually tried this. Um, and we tried this approach in another interesting region, which is the Amudarya River Basin region. Um, as, as this map illustrates, you, you can see where, where the rivers go through. Um, uh, it's the longest river in Central Asia. It's crucial to the livelihood of about uh, 50 million people. Uh, and it goes through uh, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, Kyrgyzstan, um, and flows through Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, towards the RLC. Uh, so not, you know, the easiest region to operate in. Uh, but we actually tried this approach there, and, and um, uh, also in Istanbul a few months ago, back in July, we brought together various stakeholders from the region, outside the region, uh, from uh, the, policy, uh, the policy side, from the academic side, from the private sector, and across these uh, three silos. Um, and they spent three days trying to develop models of how this, this, uh, this uh, scheme could be applied there. Uh, and they came up with some really interesting recommendations. Some of, the, some of them um, uh, Scott uh, touched upon, uh, but I'll just go through them really quickly here. Uh, so this is kind of the, how we mapped it out, the region, you know, starting from the, you know, where, where the Amundaria starts its flow from the glaciers all the way to the RLC and all the ecosystems that it, that it uh, uh, operates uh, in, and all the sectors that it touches upon. And these experts and, and stakeholders that we brought together came up with, with some interesting points. Um, something like a payment for ecosystem services. So have all people who um, you know, are around this basin uh, responsible for it from start to finish. Um, so you know, if, if somebody at, at, the, um, you know, at, at, at the beginning of, of this river uh, is polluting and, and, uh, and one of, one of the um, uh, downstream countries is affected, somebody has to compensate the other, and, and the other way around as well. Hey, can I ask you one sure. second, how you define the stakeholder? Is, are we talking about government entities, or economic, or business, or little combination of that? So it's a combination of all. All, the, all these, all these uh, stakeholders, um, for example, they come from government, um, non-government environmental organizations, um, um, you know, private sector companies like 
for example, Coca-Cola, who you know has a big stake in um, you know getting you know water to, for its bottling plants. Um, um, you know, big um, wheat growers. Uh, you know, big the big agriculture companies. So all these, um, you know, coming together. Basically, all these are considered stakeholders. Um, another recommendation is to build an integrated basin-wide information system. So also, this is this is integrating um, uh, all different actors in this region uh, from across sectors um, uh, to 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 cooperate uh, between upstream downstream countries. Um, and to create a system for strengthening information exchange and cooperation at the regional and the national level. Um, something that we really struggle with also in the Middle East is, is uh, transparency, um, 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 especially when it comes to water data. So uh, a lot of the data is, is treated um, um, you know, as, as a security issue in, in a lot of these countries. Um, so if you go to ask for, you know, real data on, on, on the water availability in this country, uh, it'll be with um, the military or with intelligence agencies. So there's really a lack of transparency when it comes to that uh, information about um, uh, natural resources. Um, something that Scott touched upon is the strengthening regional economic integration, and that's something that is really important for, um, uh, for the Middle East. Uh, starting with um, 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 strengthening, uh, uh, creating a, a, a common energy market. Uh, why not looking at a common um, water market at some point? So one of the participants that we had from Saudi Arabia in, in the conference in Istanbul uh, was talking about um, um, establishing some kind of a market in the GCC for water. So you'll have desalination plants, for example, in the UAE or in Saudi Arabia, and those have pipelines that are feeding, um, you know, land in Yemen, for example, or somewhere else that needs it. Um, next recommendation is a network of training centers for improved uh, uh, irrigation capacity building and service provision. So that's something that really we also don't have and don't cooperate on in, in the Middle East and, and uh, can be applicable there as well. Not taking much more time. Um, a Nexus Knowledge and Innovation Center. So also because we have, um, you know, water center, we have an agriculture center, we have energy center, uh, where some of this innovation is taking place, but we don't have one that brings them all together and looks at it from uh, from a Nexus approach. So with that, I'll stop there, and um, you know, we can we can discuss more in Q and A. Uh. I think we'll uh, open it up for questions, and just just raise your hand and, and fire away. John. A little background. My first job in the Middle East was training director for Peace Corps in Yemen in 1974, and one of our big projects was well drilling, extending wells. They had been in the seventh year of a drought at that time, and almost all the got trees were gone. So it was because they had um, burned them for fuel. But I'm, I'm concerned, I guess, primarily with this notion that the nexus is not on the radar of decision makers. It's been in the U.S. strategic threat assessments in 2010. Uh, but there is a gap between talking about it and doing anything about it. But the second gap that bothers me is, um, is that we're already siloed in how we approach it. Uh, the Cutter Foundation has a dry land project that they're working on, which deals with the nexus. OCP Foundation, which is the phosphate producer in Morocco, is sponsoring a number of projects in England and in the United States on the nexus issues. They're, of course, directing it toward Africa, but the same issues as Ray pointed out. So I think that <clears throat> two things. One, that we need to make sure that we're not being siloed in our approach to how we try to create an awareness of what can be done and what the issues are by limiting ourselves to either, I mean, it's fine to become an expert in a certain region like the Middle East, but you've already left out North Africa, for example, which is, has as many water issues as the peninsula. The big difference is the Arabian Peninsula has money to do something about it. Um, so I think there's <clears throat> a lot of inter country discussion that could be very helpful there. But secondly, I think that um, these ideas of creating these networks of banks 
uh, whether they're knowledge banks or innovation banks or data banks, might be a really good starting point. Uh, Africa has close to 60% of the world's arable land that's not being used or is underutilized. So that may be by having almost a demonstration effect, create some opportunities for more integrated thinking in terms of the larger MENA region, playing off of that. And your example was not the MENA region, it was Central Asia. So I think that we have to um, caution ourselves about siloing our own efforts. I think it's useful because we can't cover the whole world, but at the same time, having continuous outreach to the other people who are specializing, specializing in other regions. I think that's really important. But I think I want to thank you both for the remarks you made. I thought the, you're, you were right on target, uh, very insightful with uh, dealing with these issues, but I don't think we should um, uh, figure out that, okay, I think as you pointed out, Scott, that it took them 40 or 60 years to create this problem in Saudi Arabia. And I remember being in Hofuf in the Eastern Province and watching all this water in these huge canals evaporating at the rate of 15% a day to feed the date groves. So it took 40 years to create the problem. It hopefully won't take another 40 years to, to take the necessary action to, to at least make it better, particularly with the enormous increase in population that you referred to, David. Would either of you like to comment? I'll, I'll just, just briefly, you know, one of the things that we all were discussing at this conference is, you know, there's a, a real protectionism on just the information and data alone. You know, let's forget about agreements and, 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 and real substantive, you know, enforcement, anything like that, just the data. And, and, and that's a real problem because it shows a lack of trust. And this isn't just between countries, it's within countries as well. And so that, that, that's, that's, uh, you know, a, a real hurdle that, that we, we did discuss. How could you do something that actually has, and by the way, the U.S. is also protection oriented towards data. We had, we had NASA participate in our conference, and they have some great stuff, and they, they, sh they would show us some of it. <laughs> I'll, let, I'll let you, you guys. Uh, sure, just a, uh, three, three kind of quick things. Um, first of all, just by way of, I think, a, a good example of um, uh, a positive action uh, in some of those areas. Uh, I, I think USAID has done a really good job in kind of with respect to one of these the areas that I mentioned, which is the uh, called WASH, uh, Water, Sanitation, and Health, um, which also kind of um, relates to, uh, you know, drilling wells and making sure that there's a reliable clean water supply um, for local communities. Um, under uh, Secretary Clinton, uh, that was made a, a big priority uh, in terms of AID um, uh, financing and, and uh, development work, and I think it's been very successful. Um, you know, that the challenge, though, is that that's a very kind of small piece, to be honest, of the, of the overall uh, water issue. It's a very important one, and it's one that has very high impact, so I, I think it's, it's um, you know, well... Um, well worth uh, uh, USAID focusing its efforts there, but you know it's not not going to solve Yemen's uh, uh, water problem, and and that sort of leads me to my second point is that I think in a lot of ways some of these issues that we're talking about uh, the U.S. It, it's it's way beyond um, either the capacity or I would argue kind of like the uh, the core interests of the United States to try to solve these issues. Uh, I mean to the extent that I think for example Yemen's water problem is. Um, is somebody else's problem, it's, it's Saudi's problem. Um, and, uh, and that just leads me to a uh, third and, and final point, which is though, there are, there are certain cases where uh, I think from a, a, an American perspective, uh, policymakers ought to be very concerned about some of these issues, and they have to do with the vulnerability of water supply infrastructure in the Middle East. Um, so again, you know, the Mosul Dam is, is uh, the, the best recent example, but there are lots of smaller ones in Yemen where, um, uh, where militants have targeted uh, water supply infrastructure very deliberately uh, as a way of disrupting water supply and thereby uh, undermining uh, the legitimacy uh, of, the, of the state. Uh, and by all accounts, it's been, been very effective in doing that. Um, I might just really quickly, one other thing um, is that, because you mentioned, I think, quite rightly, kind of that there's, you know, there's a bigger regional picture here, too, and we've, we've focused pretty much um, uh, uh, on the, the Arabian Peninsula and, and partly Central Asia. Um, South Asia is a, an area where a lot of these issues are really coming to a head um, for a slightly different reason, though, and it's mainly because the economic stakes of water scarcity uh, and water challenges are much higher 
in South Asia. This is a region that's booming economically. It's growing very fast. Um, uh, and, but there's, uh, uh, there, there are real problems on the horizon. Um, whereas the economic consequences for a place, a region like North Africa are lower just, you know, I mean, tragically so because it's not a, not a, uh, a dynamically, uh, economically developing region. A couple of points on, on, on Africa. Uh, you mentioned one of the, the ideas, of course, Saudi Arabia has uh, begun to, has engaged in is, is outsourcing food production to Africa, which can make sense, of course. You, you have the foodstuff industry in Saudi Arabia that's fairly well developed, but we can't grow this stuff here anymore. How can we grow it somewhere else? So you see you know, leasing or purchasing of farmland in Sudan, for example. Now, the Saudis have stumbled into a whole bunch of other problems that have nothing to do with them except, you know, who's gotten this land and who's been pushed off it, which they're kind of finding out. But it at least shows some experiments on how this can work. And again, you know, you're right in mentioning resources are a factor, obviously. If you can afford to experiment this way, great. If you can't, what are you going to do? Um, the other thing is, you know, one problem I didn't mention, but we did discuss at our conference, was, was the Ethiopia-Egypt spat over, over the dams on the Nile. And, you know, this is a situation where, for the, for the moment, it looks like cooler heads are prevailing. And there is a discussion about how we do this. You know, Egypt for, Egypt's posture for decades, based on very old, outdated treaties, was if you touch the Nile, you know, them's fighting words. You know, that's... that's the war, that's the red line. And so when Ethiopia just said, well, we're gonna do it anyway, what do you do then? And so because Egypt had its own political turmoil, uh, it wasn't you know, ready for, to pursue a war, so it's, for, it, it, it's forced some diplomatic discussion and obviously you know, the negotiation process perhaps can lay a framework for some kind of renewed you know, agreements in the Nile Basin. Now, it hasn't been a success yet, but, but at least it's, it's ongoing. Just wanted to point a couple of those things out. this so it is it is very important the quantity of I mean the quantity of the water then it's very important for us and the next is the quality of the water in in Euphrates the the quality of the water it's I mean the water is very polluted and we are facing a, a huge challenge for that so please if you can focus on that it's very important because we ha this water is not anymore uh, I mean in, in maybe if uh, in, 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 in a few years, it's not going to be used even for agriculture. It's very, very polluted. Thank you. I, th I think that was touched upon in, in one of the recommendations that, that uh, the group produced, and it's treating um, you know, that, that basin system as one system from, from start to finish. Um, so you know, partly uh, Turkey and you know, Syria will be responsible for the quality of water that you're getting at the end, right? Uh, so, and also you, Iraq, will pay services for services that, that could you know, better the quality of water at, at the source. Um, so I, I think in, in a way that, that treating it as one system, um, you know, transcending beyond the borders that you have will, will help fix part of that problem. Uh, yeah, and, and uh, just a, a, a quick uh, note on that. Um, so generally, there tend to be, and I, I apologize, I'm not uh, as familiar with um, uh, with rivers I should be in terms of where the pollution's coming from, but generally, you have two sources. Either it's kind of uh, urban uh, uh, waste or you ha or from, uh, runoff from, uh, from agriculture, pesticides and things like that. Um, the uh, urban uh, sort of waste problem is generally um, a regulatory issue, um, or that's, that's how it's been approached elsewhere in the world. Um, uh, you know, you just try to uh, uh, enforce uh, pollution control legislation. Um, the runoff problem is much harder to solve. Um, we have lots of problems with that here in the United States. Um, and the, the best thing seems to be um, to just try to convince um, uh, farmers by 
you know, whatever combination of uh, kind of education campaigns and, uh, and removing subsidies to use less uh, fertilizer um, and, uh, and thereby decrease the runoff. It's all transboundary. Yeah. Well, yeah. Then, then, yeah. As Ray, as Ray said. Yeah. Well, I mean, obviously, it's very difficult under normal circumstances. But you're not under normal circumstances, and getting Syria, Turkey, and Iraq to work together on any issue um, is very difficult, if not impossible, right now. At, at that level, you know, Ray's talking about track two, how you could do this through an NGO process or some kind of a body that has some kind of neutral and, and having the players agree to participate in this and the various stakeholders there. That's really your only option right now given, given the con conflict going on and the animosity between the governments. Actually, sorry, I have one more, one more thing to say on this because I feel bad that that was, uh, I, I sort of went down the wrong track there. Um, one, one interesting example is uh, for a long time there was a big problem with salt on the Colorado River. Um, and essentially, Mexico has a very important agricultural region just south of the border um, that they rely on water for the Colorado to irrigate. Um, for a period of about 40 years, that water uh, was too, uh, had too high salt content to be useful for irrigation. In the 1970s, the Mexican government said, you know, Washington, if, if you want to have a good relationship um, with us, you will uh, find some way to reduce the salt content. Uh, of the water that we receive. Uh, and the United States uh, built a, at the time, very expensive desalination plant um, to, uh, to uh, improve the quality of the water. And it, it was, um, but the key thing there, I think, was that the, the Mexican government raised it to kind of the level of a, a strategic issue. They said, you know, our relationship is, you know, this is important enough for us that, that uh, our relationship is contingent on this. Uh, and so if you could find some way of kind of um, raising the diplomatic stakes and maybe trying to find some creative financing for uh, some kind of uh, treatment options, not necessarily a plant, but, you know, maybe um, uh, uh, programs to try to reduce fertilizer use up, you know, in some of these upstream countries or whatever um, from the World Bank or something else, that would be perhaps constructive. problems in Iraq are quite substantial because it's not just the water quality that's coming there. The water flows are significantly less for two reasons. One is because of the severe drought that they, the region is, has been suffering. And this past year is probably the, one of the worst droughts, they say, since the 1950s. So you've got us a problem of not only the effluents going into the river, primarily probably from Syria, where there are no wastewater treatment plants that are operating. You have significantly reduced water flow, so the impact on Iraq is tremendous. Okay. Uh, William George, American. Um, so, not really. Um, I mean, there, and I, I have to admit, I, I don't know um, uh, a whole lot about the specifics of like uh, major project financing, but my understanding is that a lot of, for example, the desalination plants are financed uh, nationally. Um, there is a, an important kind of um, uh, process going the other way, though. Um, Israel, for example, is building lots of desalination plants in China, I think three three or five, something like that. Um, so there is some kind of outward investment. Uh, I don't know of substantial inward investment. There might, there might be some. But. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a really interesting point that you actually have, you have some capacity in the region to develop, develop this, but because of geopolitical concerns, you, you actually can't, don't have cross-border, uh, you know, cooperation on it. Um, uh, but 
we, we can get back to you more on this, but, but I, I think the, the interesting um, thing to look on would be a regional uh, uh, you know, uh, investment. So for example, Yemen is a security concern for Saudi Arabia. Um, some of this is being, um, uh, is being fueled by uh, the water and, and food crisis in Yemen. Uh, so, you know, wouldn't it be a very Im interesting and important investment for Saudi Arabia to, to, to um, you know, invest heavily in desalination plants in Yemen or, or uh, you know, try to, to um, uh, temper the situation a little bit? And also, it's, it, it'll be important to look at in, in countries, you know, uh, that share a river basin like Iraq, Syria, and, and Turkey. Uh, how they can cooperate together to uh, to do that, even, you know, waste treatment plants, desalination plants um, uh, along the basin as well. Um, I, I don't know any any uh, on a on a regional basis, but on an individual basis, Saudi Arabia, for example, has tried to. So they 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 sat back and said, we need a plan that's integrated and coordinated and cooperative inside our country first. So they combined several different uh, agencies that had different overlapping jurisdictions and prevented things from happening. And one of the things they've encouraged both first inside Saudi Arabia, but now from foreign investment as well, is investment in the water sector. And, and that is going on. There's also um, calls for FD, FDI in the agriculture sector as well. Um, that's pretty extensive. Uh, and, and that's part of a coordinated thing. Also, you know, investing in research. They'll, they'll look at any technology. I've gone over with several U.S. universities who are, you know, into the whole call for, you know, more crop, less drop. And they go to all the different ministries to kind of get their blessings as well as to um, businesses in the kingdom as well. So there is, there is more involvement from the private sector, but you got to understand this is a relatively new field. This is almost exclusively done by the governments themselves, and Saudi Arabia is probably a little more advanced than a lot of other countries in looking at this. Um, you were mentioning Israel on the desalinization plants. Saudi Arabia is also starting to do this. Um, they had last year, actually, they gave the first showing of some of their technology at a conference in China, um, which, is, which is very advanced uh, solar desalinization. Good technology. And there's finally an idea in Saudi Arabia, well, we've invested in a lot of this research. We might be able to actually make, make some money off of exporting it as well. I mean, there's obviously the challenge in Yemen, which is a security threat, and it would make sense to do something like that. Um, but you also have to realize Saudi Arabia still has to fight to meet its own needs. And not all of its plants are using the best technology. And even if you do have resources, they're not, they're not infinite. So um, you know, they can only build good desal plants in their own country that quickly, particularly without outside investment. And, you know, Saudi Arabia still has some of the old monsters, uh, desalinization plants that were built in the, the 70s that you literally are, you know, cost more, you're putting more barrels in than you're get, of oil than you're getting barrels of water out, so. Uh, good morning. Thank you for um, hosting this very important event. Um, I'm Mahmoud from the Embassy of Egypt in DC. Uh, I just have two quick uh, comments. The first one is related to the fact that actually over 98% or I wouldn't say 100% of uh, water resources in the Middle East is actually transboundary water. So uh, I believe that uh, the major crisis that the Middle East is facing is related to the lack of institutional arrangements that actually govern the transboundary water uh, between the Middle East countries and the upstream countries out of the Middle East zone, uh, which is related to some of uh, the points that the three of you have pointed to, uh, the lack of information sharing, the lack of uh, cooperation, uh, it's always easier for the upstream countries to tend to uh, uh, oppose the norms of international law uh, when it comes to prior notification or other standards and actually go ahead and, and uh, do these kind of projects that would harm the uh, uh, downstream countries. Which will lead me to my second comment, which is related to Egypt uh, and Ethiopia or, uh, or the Nile uh, issue. Uh, uh, the fact that Egypt's water security is on a stake here 
is related to uh, the amount of water which is allocated to Egypt, 55.5 billion cubic meter, has been allocated over 50 years ago when the population of Egypt was 40 million people. Now we're over 90 million people. We're already suffering from water scarcity and uh, 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 a serious food security problem in Egypt, if you're familiar with, with these uh, issues, and I'm sure that you are. Uh, so it's not, of course, it has a legal aspect, as you mentioned, some historical agreements, uh, but it's not to the extent that Egypt never uh, actually pointed that we would go to war for, uh, for a project or something. Uh, the fact that Egypt is uh, 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 in these diplomatic efforts to solve the issue of the Nile is actually related to uh, the intention of Egypt to cooperate in order to reach a solution for this, for this issue. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, just a quick response. Um, yeah, the, you know, the, the case of the Nile is sort of the, um, uh, the, the most often referred to one of sort of why um, the situation in which you describe where you have transboundary uh, rivers leads to, to conflict. Um, the, and, and the thing is, I mean, you, if you look at water as a one-dimensional issue, uh, it inevitably uh, is a, a, uh, an intractable situation, right? Because you have one country, Ethiopia, that can unilaterally build a dam that uh, disrupts uh, flow downstream. But for most countries, and in most cases, you know, the relationship between those two countries isn't defined purely by uh, the fact that they share a river. Uh, and so uh, I, I think that the, the solution, particularly in the case of the Nile, is uh, you just need to, to try to um, tie the, the, ri the river issue and the water issue to other uh, dimensions of the relationship. So you need to think about where can, you know, we sort of do some, uh, some, some negotiation around uh, whatever it might be, trade. Um, uh, you know, ties in, in other, other policy areas. Because if you just sort of look at it as a one-dimensional water issue, Egypt can't win, right? Um, but if you kind of expand the, the scope of conflict is a, is a, um, a phrase, you know, that's, that's usually where you can find some solutions and where you can get some, some leverage uh, over a country like Ethiopia that as the upstream party otherwise has the power in the situation. The issue of governance here is really important, uh, especially transboundary, uh, you know, cross-border one, um, given the, the recent turmoil in the region. So, you know, when, when Egypt was undergoing its, its transition, um, it wasn't in, in a position to negotiate or be able to, you know, uh, to leverage any sort of a relationship uh, against Ethiopia to, you know, change its plans or, or to, to uh, you know, slow down the buildup of the dam. Um, so. Same thing might be happening now with with Syria and Iraq. Um, you know, with Turkey, you know, being uh, uh, unopposed in its plans. You know, for 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 um, um, for Euphrates and Tigris. So I think that's an important point that needs to be resolved also separately. Um, you know, governance mechanisms um, uh, for transboundary water issues. Um, we talked about how water kind of has a lot of underpinnings for many of these conflicts, and now with ISIS moving into key areas like the Mosul Dam, um, my question is twofold. One, what is something that we can do to kind of limit their ability to do this? Is there a solution that will help stop it? And with the water issue becoming a bigger and bigger problem with the ongoing drought, is there, do you think there will be an increase in these sort of military acts to kind of take over these key areas? Um, so I, I think it's um, it's difficult to do too much about it uh, other than to kind of um, uh, encourage our, and I'm speaking from kind of an American perspective, encourage sort of partners, allies in the region uh, to devote uh, resources to protecting this infrastructure. So I mean, oftentimes um, uh, governments in the region, th these, these partners and allies, they, they don't devote um, scarce military or security resources to securing this infrastructure because this infrastructure serves populations that they uh, are not 
you know, uh, they're not necessarily as concerned with as they are others. Uh, and I think that, that, again, from an American perspective, um, you know, it, it's important to try to encourage um, our, our partners and allies to, uh, to recognize that this, um, this is corrosive to, to stability, th this capacity. I mean, looking down the line, there, there are some things you can do. Um, parts of, of the Middle East, um, uh, again, I'm thinking particularly of Yemen, but, but other, other countries as well, have a lot of indigenous uh, irrigation systems that are in a lot of ways much more sustainable than uh, groundwater drilling. They've fallen into disrepair um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, you know, you could potentially think about targeting aid um, to, uh, to try to repair some of those, but that's a, a longer term and less kind of certain of success um, solution. Um, second part of your question, yes, I, I think uh, we will see more of uh, uh, more of these kinds of, uh, uh, of attacks. Um, and though it's much lower probability as an event, I think it's not um, out of the question that if there were to be a, a, a significant state on state conflict that um, the first um, uh, set of infrastructure uh, that would be targeted would be uh, water supply to major cities, especially desalination plants. It's hard to tackle such an issue with, with a group like ISIS because, you know, it's, it's a fanatical group. You're not going to reason with them and say, don't do this. Um, but the interesting point that, that Scott made is with state-to-state uh, -state conflict. Uh, you can perhaps get try to get to an agreement where, you know, that like, like we have rules of engagement not to attack, you know, somebody's uh, um, civilian facilities like hospitals or, or schools or something like that. Also, you know, uh, have this critical infrastructure as uh, part, part of those rules of engagement. Um, Just, just another, another side, and I'm not, not talking on Iraq specifically, although it does apply, is, you know, th there is a role for third parties to get in the way to prevent these kinds of conflicts, um, particularly when you have a situation where you have a country that's preoccupied with other problems um, and doesn't have the leverage for the moment, like Iraq, uh, as well as, as Egypt at the time on, on the Nile. Um, you, you did have a violation of the treaty, for example, uh, with, e with e Ethiopia unilaterally constructing a dam. There's, there was no question about that. And, but, but what do you do about it? Now, Ethiopia had its set of talking points, and the Egyptians said, well, this, this is a violation. Let's go for international mediation. Now, I'm not saying there's a U.S. role specifically in this, but there has to be a process where you can lay out grievances to prevent state-on-state -state conflicts and try to, try to address at least humanitarian aspects in situations where you can't deal with the state specifically. Be, you know, ISIS is, a, is, is one example, but there are other entities that are powerful players that are not states. Hi, I'm Pallavi Nuka from Innovations for Successful Societies at Princeton University. Um, I was wondering if we could go back and talk a little bit more about um, domestic actors uh, before governments can deliver on international cooperation. They need to be able to deliver domestically in terms of managing their own internal water use. And I was wondering if um, you could speak a little bit more about uh, domestic policies and strategies. I know you mentioned desalinization. I was wondering if there are other strategies that uh, governments in the region have tried. I know Jordan has tried to work with um, water user cooperatives and they've tried to use a distributed model for water management. Um, there's also been the move from uh, uh, canal irrigation to drip irrigation. And I'm wondering whether, what other strategies uh, could governments apply um, in terms of uh, distributed solutions or centrally managed uh, solutions in order to uh, improve the effectiveness of irrigation systems. Uh, so I might just sort of um, uh, pick up on that. I mean, I think um, for a lot of the types of, uh, of, of things that you suggested, uh, economic uh, measures can, can be a very powerful kind of way of driving um, innovation, conservation, efficiency improvements by whatever, uh, whatever kind of uh, technology. So, you know, the nice thing about kind of economics, uh, using economic tools, is that uh, you don't have to, say, pick a... Uh, a technology or a set of technologies or, or a regulatory approach. You just sort of set the rules and, um, uh, and you, uh, uh, you then let uh, price incentives drive that. Now, I, I spent a lot of time and deliberately so on what the, you know, what the reasons that that uh, general approach um, 
uh, is, is, is challenging to implement in the Middle East. Um, but I do think that um, there's a lot of potential for, um, for doing things like, um, you know, uh, raising water, uh, water prices in certain, uh, for certain categories or uses of water, uh, and particularly in urban areas. I mean, the Middle East is, is uh, tricky um, because you have uh, all these kind of uh, uh, political issues surrounding um, different groups and the, the distributional uh, effect of, for example, increasing water prices um, on, uh, on irrigators in a particular area or whatever. So there's a lot of tricky politics, but I think it's well worth um, focusing on, uh, on trying to get consensus around, uh, around limited uh, water price increases uh, or trading. And I think like water use, user associations that you mentioned can be really good sort of fora for, for getting that consensus in particular areas. Scott covered this nicely, but one one issue you can point to, and, and we mentioned that the, the conference also is uh, subsidies, especially fuel subsidies. So when it came to Yemen, you know, uh, diesel was so cheap that anybody could, you know, d d dig a well and just pump out, you know, the all the aquifer water, uh, you know, using really cheap diesel. Uh, so if they're looking at things like you know subsidies, uh, increasing the price of of, uh, uh, of uh, oil and, and diesel fuel, uh, for example, will will dis dis uh, incentivize people from going their own way and then digging holes, digging wells, and and, uh, and uh, using up the water supply. I'll point to to a, to a few things. I mean, one one thing that instantly popped in mind when you when you asked the question is you know last week there was this actually quite funny. Um, set of footage of Bill Gates having a glass of water, you know, is that a, I don't know if anyone saw this, but is that a, he had either invested in this project or not, but it, it, it converted raw sewage into drinking water. And of course, Bill, they had, they wanted Gates to try a glass of this at the end of this, and, and the look on his face um, before he took a sip was, was, was noticeably, uh, he was pained, but he did it. Um, but, 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 Kind of best practices is one thing. You know, Saudi Arabia, one of the things they've done is they're not ready to drink the sewage water, but they are ready to use that for irrigation. So you get it, you, get, you improve the quality enough that you can use it for something else. There's also, you know, practices like capti how you capture runoff when you do have a rare uh, rain rainfall. Um, these things are important. And then, you know, you have the highest water usage rate per person in the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia, per person in the globe. So there's, there, there's a personal usage, a societal educational device, and, and the Saudis direct, you know, brought this up at, at our conference directly. You have to change how people use water too, the mindset. Because if we're not paying for it, what's, what's the in disincentive up for us using as much of it as we can, taking five showers a day, whatever you want. But, but those, those things are important. They do make, make a difference. And then you have situations in some countries, um, Egypt, for example, where you have a really aging infrastructure, and it's not lost in the country, but you're losing, I'm talking like 30% of the water from leaking pipes. That's a lot of water just to lose, period. And, but, but to do this, obviously, it's a massive infrastructure investment. And when you have economies that are trying to get, get up and running, it, it's, it's, it's doubly uh, challenging. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Isma Yassin. I'm also from Commonics International. Um, and I've been working now on a couple of projects um, in water in the Middle East. And I'm interested to see how um, or if you know about uh, Aqua, the Arab Countries Water Utilities Association, um, and their growing role in the region, and whether or not you see Aqua and other regional organizations that are still sort of growing and struggling to become major players in this sector have more of an influence, and do you, how do you see that influence sort of working with um, the... Uh, Arab League or the GCC countries buying into um, what the challenges are for less developed, less wealthy countries. Um, thank you. Uh, I think, 
I think actually one of uh, our dialogue participants mentioned um, that that particular group. Uh, I don't know much about it um, uh, in particular, but uh, but I think that that is exactly the, the type of um, organization and, and forum that's really helpful in, in um, spreading, I think, particularly kind of technical knowledge uh, across countries. I guess my only comment would be that, again, from kind of a, a, of a um, tackling the, the challenge um, perspective, you know, it would need to be that kind of technical knowledge and cooperation, communication would need to be backed up by resources. We need to be backed up by investment. Um, so it wouldn't be enough, you know, for example, just to have workshops and meetings, which I'm sure are, are happening uh, quite regularly uh, across the region, but it would need to be um, backed up by some, some serious investment, probably both from public and private um, sources um, to improve uh, water supply in yeah, places like Yemen. Some of these, these organizations are, are, are at least starts, but they're only as strong as the countries who are involved in them let them to be. And you're talking a regional uh, you know, picture. What countries do you include? What countries are excluded? And how much power are you going to give? I mean, we're talking again about countries that can't share data on water or unwilling to. Uh, if you went through the Arab League, you're immediately excluding Israel, Turkey, and Iran which are major players on water issues. They're, they're right there, and they're, they're part, part and parcel of the, the challenge and problem, you know, and Ethiopia and, and, and the Nile Basin countries in Egypt's case. So, you, so what kind of entity works? Now, the GCC has a little more advanced conversations, uh, but again, you know, they have the resources to do it. Uh, they have determined as, as, as individual nations that these are national, you know, they're not necessarily crisis but it's, it's close to it. So there's a political will that doesn't um, exist elsewhere. And again, you're talking about nations that aren't necessarily competing with each other. So they have every reason to cooperate. Whereas a lot of the other cases, you have reasons not to cooperate. Hi, Ricky Pastorelli, the Stimson Center. Um, I had a question about the, the Amu Darya Basin uh, project. Uh, we actually did a similar project in the Indus. It was quite successful. But I'm wondering what the next steps um, for your organization was with the project, and how did you, did you or do you foresee elevating some of those great findings at the sort of track two level to a more institutional level. Um, and then a second question about the data sharing issue, um, which is obviously huge between India and Pakistan. Um, how do you see overcoming some of those issues? One way that we were looking at was remote sensing to sort of bypass any sort of formal uh, data center, but that's not the only way. So what, what ways have you seen or um, would recommend approaching the data sharing issue? Um, on, on the uh, Mudaria uh, um, issue and, and the, the technical aspect, the next step uh, uh, that, that the participants foresee is um, uh, pilot projects. So uh, starting with these recommendations, um, we'll start you know, uh, each one of them a pilot project in, in one of the countries or one of their Arpeian states. Uh, um, and we'll see how, um, you know, how effective it is and, and if it's feasible to, uh, to proceed on a basin-wide uh, approach. Um, from, from taking it, taking it to a, a level from the track two to, to institutions, um, I think uh, part, of, part of it lies in the coalition that's being built uh, and the, bring in all the uh, cross-sector uh, stakeholders into it. Uh, so you have governments that are being part of the solution, policymakers part of the solution, parliamentarians that are part of the solution, uh, the private sector is part of the solution. Uh, so it's easier for, for um, you know, when you have these recommendations to kind of uh, put them uh, uh, in front of policymakers and, and uh, you know, kind of over, uh, overcome the political obstacles uh, that are in the way, especially on this issue, uh, the uh, cross-border uh, uh, kind of obstacles uh, that we're dealing with. I might just add something quickly on the remote sensing stuff. I think that's uh, tremendously important. Um, uh, we've talked a lot about the problems of data sharing, and that's absolutely uh, accurate, that that's a, 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 big, uh, a big issue and has been. Um, it's becoming less so in the sense that um, we're kind of nearing the stage where 
the data is out there from remote sensing, or, or at least a rough approximation of it. Um, so there are satellites that can very accurately track, for example, uh, changes in like uh, snowpack, which gives you a pretty good idea of like how much water is being uh, injected into a river in the mountains, uh, as well as groundwater. So you can track fairly accurately um, how much groundwater is being pumped out of a given uh, area. And uh, in fact, I think your colleague David Michael knows about this, but there was a paper um, that looked at uh, groundwater depletion using a satellite in uh, the Indus Basin and, uh, and was showed pretty clearly, although they didn't intend to, uh, that India was uh, stealing large amounts of water from Pakistan by just over-pumping uh, on its, uh, its, side of the, um, its side of the border. So that data is, I think, increasingly kind of getting there. The challenge, though, is, uh, you know, one, how you incorporate it into decision-making. Um, the Nile is an interesting example of that, where the World Bank's invested a lot of money in creating this, like, online platform. Um, but it's, it hasn't really reached decision makers. Um, and that gets to the second point, which is just that, I mean, it's good to have impartial data, but there are often people who don't like it, right? Who don't it, like what it tells them. It's not good to have impartial data if it doesn't serve your interests. That, I mean. That's it. <laughs> oh, any, any other questions? Well, thank you again for uh, joining us today. Thank, thank you for, to the Howling Center and to our panelists, and uh, sign off. <laughs>